of you brought your Bible with you tonight. Will you hold up the Word of God and join me, if you will, over in the book of Acts, chapter 27 tonight. I'd like to read two verses and really has absolutely nothing to do with the message tonight, but I want to use it, read it, and uh, maybe just spring off of it for just a little bit uh, for the message here on this Wednesday night. Acts, chapter 27, page 1187, two verses. Then leave your Bible open, if you will. And I appreciate, again, you being here with us. And please pray much about the services Sunday. Let's pray for a good day. Sunday school and on the buses. What a good day we had on the church bus this Sunday. That was good. And it just seems like it's creeping up slowly but surely. And I appreciate all the hard work of our bus workers. Let's pray for a good day in Sunday school. And think our Sunday school numbers are creeping back up. And I really think, I think it's right now, don't be mad at me, but I think it helped us just going back to the one service right now. It seemed like it has. We had a great crowd in here Sunday morning, and so uh, it seems like it's just kind of gave us a shot in the arm right now. And so uh, I appreciate your willingness to work through us with all this process and hopefully better days ahead. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 27, two verses. Then just bear with me for just a moment. Look at verse 40 and verse 41. The Bible said, and when they, which are the soldiers... And even the prisoners that are on board this boat, there are 200, 276 of these people that are on this boat. Um, the majority of them are prisoners, the rest of them are sailors. And the Bible said that when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And by the way, I think they did this on purpose. They ran it aground, and the forepart stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part of the ship, uh, hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. One bad shipwreck. I want to preach tonight from, well, not this text, but just from all over. I want to preach tonight on some ships I do and don't want to ride on. Some ships that I do and don't want to ride on. Let's pray. Father, bless your word tonight and speak to our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today, as most of us are aware of, is November the 10th. It is the 314th day of this year. There are exactly 51 days remaining in the year. There are now only 44 days until Christmas. By the way, how many of y'all got your trees up? Be honest, raise your hand. How many of y'all got all your shopping done? Be honest, raise your hand. I hate people like y'all. <laughs> well, here's what I did. I looked up today's date in history, November the 10th, and here are some of the more notable things that happened on this date in history. In 1775, 246 years ago, on this date, the United States Marine Corps was founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was founded in, of all places, a tavern by a man by the name of Samuel Nicholas. How many Marines are in here tonight? Founded 246 years ago. I'm going to fast forward now 195 years to 1970. In 1970, on this date, this concluded the first week of the Vietnam War since it started where there was not one American casualty that was reported. What a great day that was. In 1982, the Vietnam War Memorial on this date opened in Washington, D.C. How many of y'all been there and saw that? 400, feet long, uh, 400 plus feet long, 58,000 names on the Vietnam War Memorial. And then on this date in 1990, 31 years ago, and I guess I had probably seen this movie no less than 597 times. The Christmas movie, Home Alone, made its premiere. I can almost quote it verbatim. Home Alone made its premiere 31 years ago. How many of y'all have already watched that this year, this Christmas season? We'll probably watch it 25 times between now and Christmas. And then here are some people, famous people that were born on November the 10th. On November the 10th, 1483, Martin Luther. Now, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther. 
the famous reformist, was born on this date in 1483. In uh, 1871 on this day, Winston Churchill, the little, little pudgy statesman that literally held England together during the days of the, of the Nazi Blitz, uh, Winston Churchill was born November the 10th, 1871. And then somebody we all know, Russell Johnson, was born on November the 10th, 1924. But there is also another event. What? Y'all don't know Russell Johnson? The skipper on Gilligan's Island, you don't know <laughs> Russell Johnson? Was born on this date in 1924. Now you know that's funny. Go ahead and laugh right there. It's okay. But there's also one other event that happened today, November the 10th, 46 years ago, today, 1975. The Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. Here's, here's a picture of the Edmund Fitzgerald. She is uh, 728 feet long and unloaded, weighed approximately 13 tons. She was launched, if you'll leave that up, she was launched in 1957 at a cost of $8.4 million. The Edmund Fitzgerald was, uh, was owned by the Northwestern Mutual Insurance Company. And the reason it was named the Edmund Fitzgerald is that's because that's who the CEO of the company was at that time, Edmund Fitzgerald. And the job of that ship that you're looking at up on the screens was to transport iron ore pellets across the Great Lakes, which were then used to build cars and washing machines, anything that was made back in those days out of, out of iron. They were, they, they were transported on these great vessels across uh, the Great Lakes. Fully loaded, the fits is what she was known as, weighed in excess of 39 tons. She was easily the most famous and well-loved ship on the, on the lakes at that time. She was known really by the cause of one of her captains who played loud, uh, played music over her loudspeakers when they would come to those locks where they would move from one lake to the next lake or when they would anchor. He was always blaring music out of her speakers and, and uh, because of that she gained the title the Queen of the Great Lakes. I've read two or three books about this ship. Let me tell you what happened to her. On November the 9th, 1975, she departed from Superior, Wisconsin. She'd been loaded down with iron ore pellets, 26 tons of these iron ore pellets, and she was bound for Detroit, Michigan. It was the last run of that year because the shipping lanes shut down on the Great Lakes because of the frigid temperatures and the ice that forms. So this was the last run of the year for the Edmund Fitzgerald. But not only was it the last run of the year for her crew, it was also the last run of her captain, Ernest McSorley. It was the last run of his life. He was retiring after this particular voyage. Tragically, she would never reach Detroit. She got out on the Great Lakes. She encountered a terrible storm whose waves were as high as 50 feet. There was another ship sailing not far behind the, the Edmund Fitzgerald named the Arthur M. Anderson. And McSorley ra radioed the Anderson and told him that his radar was out. I don't know if the antenna had blown off, but his radar was out. And he asked the Arthur Anderson to help guide them to Whitefish Bay using their radar. He radioed back at 3.55 that afternoon and told the Anderson that he had a fence rail down and that a couple of vents had blown off, and he was now listening to the port side. He told the Anderson, I'm checking down, which simply meant he was slowing down to give them a chance to catch up so they could escort him to Whitefish Bay. At 7.10 a.m., November the 10th, 1975, the Anderson radioed the fits again and asked how things were going, and Captain McSorley answered back, we are holding our own. That was the last transmission ever received from, uh, from the Edmund Fitzgerald. At 7.22, which is about 17 minutes ago, 46 years ago, the, uh, the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald disappeared off the radar screen of the author Anderson. They immediately radioed to Whitefish Bay and asked for assistance. And tragically, the mighty Fitz had gone down. She was eventually located a couple of days later 
in 535 feet deep waters, and she had actually broken in two, and her whole crew, consisting of 20, 29 men, perished, not one survivor. She was located by a United States Naval plane flying over the Great Lakes that was equipped with a magnetic radar, and they, and they picked up on the on the returns of the bouncing off of those, those waves, and, uh, and they, they pinpointed the exact location where she had went down. But to this day, nobody knows what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald. In 1995, divers went down to the wreckage at the request of the family and actually retrieved the bell off the Edmund Fitzgerald. I think we have a picture of that bell. And that bell now hangs in the uh, Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum near Michigan State University. There is a picture of that bell. In 1976, an English songwriter by the name of Gordon Lightfoot recorded a song about the sinking of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And it actually went to number two on the charts of that year. And each year on the anniversary of the tragedy, which happened today, you can watch it online. It happened today, all the members, remaining members of the family, which are now basically the children and the grandchildren of those men that perished in the, in the wreck, they gather today. The bell is rang 29 times in honor of all 29 men who perished. Now, I told you that story to tell you this. In our text tonight, uh, we read about another shipwreck. The Bible tells us there in verse 40 and verse number 41 that this ship, don't know the name of it, but the Apostle Paul was sailing on this ship and the Bible said it ran aground and it eventually, through the beating of the ferocious waves, actually broke the ship apart. In fact, there is a city over in the country today of Malta. There's a city over there. The island was called Melita. Today it's called Malta. And there is actually a place there in the country of Malta. It's a little island nation. And the second largest city on that island uh, is called St. Paul's Bay. I think we have a picture of that up on the screens. There's a picture of St. Paul, Paul's Bay. That is the very place, supposedly, where Paul and the other 275 men that were on board this boat, hanging on boards and broken pieces of the ship, actually floated to the island of Melita in our Bible, present-day Malta, and all of them were saved from being de destroyed and perishing in this terrible, terrible storm. Now, I want you to look this way. You say, Preacher, thank you for telling us all of that. What does that have to do with us? Tomorrow's Veterans Day. Am I right? Tomorrow is Veterans Day. We know one of the branches of the service in the United States uh, uh, Army or the United States military is the Navy. So what I thought I would do tonight in honor of Veterans Day, and uh, just to have a little fun because I ain't been here in a while, I would like to just talk about some ships that I don't want to ride on. I'd also like to talk about some ships that I do want to ride on. Now stay with me for just a moment, but you know there are many similarities between the different kinds of ships that sail the seven seas, many types of uh, ships, various names, that really can, you know, correlate to many different types of Christians. Are you with me? So what I'd like to do tonight is just name some ships and talk about some Christians that kind of go along with the ships and the names that they're named by. So what I want to do tonight, if you'll just, we'll start here, but I'm going to ask you in just a minute to look up on the screens, and we're just going to rotate through a number of ships tonight. Let me talk a little bit about them and what they have to do with the Christian life. The first ship I don't want to ride on is a barge. As a child of God, I don't want to ride on a barge. You know why? Because they're always either having to be pushed or pulled. Now, I get it. We all need accountability in our lives, and there are all of us sometimes that need a good pull or need a good push. But, you know, that ought to be the exception and not the rule. You know, somebody ought not have to call us every week and to beg us to come to church if we're born again. If we're saved, if we're right with God, I get it. Sometimes, hey, we need a push. Sometimes we need a good kicking, don't we? Can I have an amen? But that ought to be the exception. And not the rule. I know some people that if we call them every week, they'll show up. 
And I get it. I don't mind doing that. But, you know, when are we going to reach the point that we just realize, man, somebody don't have to pull me or push me to get me to serve God. Man, there ought to be just a, a, a love for God and a love for Jesus and a, and a desire to please Him and honor Him where I don't have to be a bar. Somebody get behind me and push me or you know, somebody throw a rope around me and tug me. There ought to be a desire in my heart just to serve God and sell on for Jesus. I don't want to be a barge. Hey, I don't want somebody to have to push and pull me to get me to pray. I don't want somebody to have to push and pull me to get me the tithe. Hello. I don't want somebody to have to push and pull on me to get me to live right. I don't want to have to get somebody to push and pull on me to get me to read my Bible. Hey, I'll tell you, friend, there ought to just be a desire deep down in the heart of every child of God not to be pulled and pushed on just to serve God because we love Him. I don't want to be a barge. Number two, I don't want to be not only a barge, I don't want to be a destroyer. Now, those destroyers, uh, from what I've read about them, they were originally intended to be a weapon against torpedo attacks. Those destroyers, basically, their main job was to sink submarines. They're always escorting air aircraft carriers, and their job is just to, when a submarine is spotted or whatever, they're lightning fast, they go over, they start dropping them depth charges or whatever it is they do in our day, and their, their job is to destroy submarines. They follow the carriers in order to keep them safe. And they're very, very destructive ships. Hence the name destroyer. Can I just say tonight, not only do I not want to be a barge, I don't want to be a destroyer. Hey, too many people today are trying to tear things up all the time. They want to blow it up. Man, they want to destroy it. God hadn't called you and me to be in the in, in the tearing down business, God's called us to be in the building up business. God hadn't called us to blow things up. God's called us to build things up, build things up, to edify, to encourage one another, to be a blessing to each other. That's the reason over the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 24, we read this. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's building up each other, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but what? exhorting one another. Doing what? So much the more as we see the day approaching. Hey, let's don't be destroyers. Hey, let's build people up. Let's exhort people. Let's encourage people. Let's don't be a barge. Let's don't be a destroyer. Number three, I don't want to ride on a showboat. Those showboats, as I understand them, were actually designed to bring culture and entertainment to those along uh, the, uh, the, the river frontier, especially back years ago. You know, those people were out there and, and, uh, uh, in very primitive conditions, and these showboats would move up and down the mighty Mississippi or the Ohio River, and uh, on the inside of these showboats, there were, uh, you know, they were, uh, uh, you know, like uh, opera houses and theaters. And people went there to be entertained on the the showboat. And by the way, in our day, that name has a negative connotation because when we think about showboats, we think about people who show off. You know, we say, man, he's just a showboat or she's just a showboat. But in Bible terminology, a showboat is a hypocrite. A showboat is somebody who wants to show off and pretend to be something that in reality, they're not. Can I have an amen? In Matthew chapter number 6, boy, Jesus had some strong words to the hypocrites. He talked about them praying and how that they stood on the street corners and prayed with a loud voice. Jesus said, to be seen a man, Jesus said, they have their reward. He talked about those who tithe and, and uh, they stood on the corner, sounded the trumpet, do, 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 and then they would drop their offering in the offering plate. And somebody would say, oh, isn't he a good Christian? Look how much he gave. Jesus said, they have their reward. Jesus talked about people who fasted and they disfigured their faces and somebody saw them. They had this terrible look and they said, oh, bless his heart. He loves Jesus. He's fasting. You know what Jesus said? They have their reward. You know what they are? Showboats. They want to appear unto men to be something in reality that they are not. I don't want to ride on a showboat. 
Hey, I'll tell you what, I am far from perfect. I am not sinless, but I'm also not going to get up here and pretend to be something that I'm not. Amen. How many of y'all with me on that? I ain't going to ride on the showboat. A barge, a destroyer, a showboat. What about this? I don't want to ride on a submarine. You know why? They're always maneuvering in the dark. And when they, and they're trying to bring about their devious purposes. They're working secretly, underhandedly to promote destruction. I don't want to be that kind of a Christian that's always maneuvering under the scenes. That's always down here underneath the surface spreading the latest gossip trying to sow discord and trying to hurt the work of God. And I don't want to be a submarine man. Who wants to be a stinking submarine? Hey, I don't want to maneuver about secretly trying to get others to promote destruction and they strike and they move on without even being noticed. That's not who God's called us to be. Why, here's what the Bible said about this. Those submarines, we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from submarines. From every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Amen. Watch this verse. Jude verse 4. Certain men crept in like submarines in the dark, under the surface, unawares. Men that were a four of old uh, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying. You know what he's saying? Man, don't be a submarine. Don't sneak around under the surface trying to promote destruction. There's a lot of people that wouldn't dare stand up and say something, but they'll maneuver other people and try to get them to do their dirty work for them. Hello? I don't want to be a submarine. I don't number next. I don't want to be a sailboat. You know why? They're just blown all over the sea by the winds. Look at this verse right here, Ephesians chapter 4, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doubt. Man, I want to know what I believe, and I want to believe it. And I want to know why I believe it, and I want to stand on it. And I don't want to change. Next time, you see, next time you see me, I don't want you to have to wonder, does Brother Tim still believe in the eternal security of the believer? I don't want you to ever have to wonder next time you see me, is Brother Tim still one of those pre-tribulation raptures pre preacher? Is Brother Tim still one of them salvation by grace? I don't want to be blown here and blown there by every old wind of doctrine. I don't want to be a sailboat. I don't want to be a cruise ship. Now, I know some of y'all go on them cruises. And I, man, go for it. I mean, you pay good money. But what do they do on those cruise ships? They pet you. They pamper you. They entertain you. Why, as far as they're concerned, it's all about you. And by the way, it ought to be as much as you have to pay to ride on them things. <laughs> but can I tell you something? It ain't all about me. Not in the church. I mean, it's about Jesus. It's not a, church is not the place that I've got to come to be petted and pampered and entertained. I mean, church is the place that we come to worship God and exalt Jesus. It's all about Him. Look at this verse right here. It's a good verse. Unto Him be glory in the church. Amen and amen. I mean, man, unto Him. Point the glory to Him. Let's pet Him. Let's pamper Him. Let's, uh, let's exalt Him. Let's lift Him up. It ain't about us. I know a lot of people, when they go looking at a church for a church today, they go looking at a church that meets their needs. What about you meeting the needs of the church? It ain't about us. I don't want to be a cruise ship Christian. And then what about this? Here's my last one. I don't want to be a houseboat Christian. Those houseboats, you know what they do? They never go anywhere. They just stay anchored pretty much where they are. But can I tell you something? God didn't save me just to stay anchored where I'm at. God, and, and the Word tells me that God wants me to move on, grow up, grow in grace and knowledge. 2 Peter 3.18, I think we got it. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't want to be a houseboat and just stick in the same place all the time. Man, I want to grow and do something for God. I don't want to be a houseboat. But 
Now let me flip the switch. Here are some boats I do want to be. Watch this. Number one, I want to be a battleship. You say, preacher, what's that mean? I just want to fight the good fight of faith. Man, I, I want to do my best to take my stand for Jesus and live for Him and fight the good fight of faith. My war's not against you. Your war's, war's not against me. Our war's against the devil. And we want to do our best to be a good battler, a good fighter, a good soldier in the arm of God. I want to be a battleship. Here's what the Bible said, 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Here's what Jude said about it. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. You know what we're to be? We're to be battlers. We're to be fighters for the glory of God. I want to be a battleship. Number two, I want to be on a fishing boat. You say, a fishing boat? Yes, sir. Because Jesus said this right here. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. But I want to be a fisher of man. You know, I, 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 as a pastor... This is my aquarium. Y'all didn't know this, but y'all just little old goldfish running around in this aquarium over here. Bunch of guppies. <laughs> Bunch of algae eaters. But this is a big old aquarium that God's given us right here. And I want to do my best to take care of every fish that we got here in our church. But while we're taking care of the fish that's already here, we ought to be going out there trying to get some more fish to come in here. I want to get on a fish boat. I want to be a fisher of men. What about this? I want to be a cargo ship. You say, what about that? Man, I want to care, help carry the load. Don't you? Man, I want to do my best to carry the load. Our church has all kind of loads. And you know, in our day, tragically, more people are interested in the, in the blessings than they are the burdens. They want to share in the blessings. They don't want to help shoulder the burdens. That's the reason a lot of people don't give when they come to church. And this message is not about giving, but, you know, a lot of people want to enjoy the building. They want to enjoy the heat when it gets cold, and they want to enjoy the air when it gets hot, and they want to have a nice sound system and pretty lights that change colors. And because we're a pack of liberals around here, and crosses that's lit up, and nice new chairs to sit on, and, and uh, carpet to, to walk. We'll enjoy, we want to have all, a nursery that's second to nobody's in Forsyth County. Man, we want all of that. But don't expect us to give to it. You know something? Somebody needs to help be a cargo ship, help carry the load around here. It's easy to sit back and just enjoy it all. What are you doing to help shoulder the burden of it all? Let's be a cargo ship. Let's help carry the load. And then what about this? Why don't we be a firefighting boat? You know what they do? They just go around and put fires out. I want to be one of those firefighters. Every time a fire burns up, and can I tell you, <laughs> can I tell you this? I pray, oh, Lord, all the time going down the road. I hope so, oh, God, this is simmering right now. Don't let it break out in a fire, Jesus. Just let it smolder. Just let it smoke. But I want to be a firefighter. I want to pour water. Anytime a fire crops up in the church, somebody needs to pour some water on it. I'm not talking about spiritual fire. We're, we like that. But I'm just talking about when things happen and people get their wires crossed. Don't feed into that. Hey, don't go get a stick of wood and throw one there and say, bless God, I want to see this thing, I want to see this thing conflagrate a, a while. That means blaze for a while for us country folks. Man, let's be firefighters. Let's put the fires out. You be telling you one of the best ways to put the fire out? Don't listen to the gossip. Amen. Amen. Somebody comes to you and says, have you heard? No, and I don't want it. I don't want to. Look at these ears. Are they dipsy dumpsters? This ain't for trash. I hear enough trash. I don't want to hear it. Go tell it somewhere else. I'm not listening. You know what we're doing? Firefighting. Can I have an amen? amen? What about this? I want to be a tugboat. I told you a moment ago, I don't want somebody to have to pull and tug on me, but I don't mind pulling and tugging on others. I mean, I text people. If you look at my phone, every, you can tell every time Saturday rolls around, you can tell because there's about 12 texts on that phone to the same people every Saturday. You know what I'm doing? I'm pulling on them. I'm tugging on them. You know what I'm trying to do? Be faithful to church. We love you. You need church. You need what we got over here. 
And I try to pull on them and tug on them because I want to be a tugboat. And last of all, look at this. I want to be a ferry boat. You say, what do they do? Well, they carry people from one destination to the next destination. I want to help people to get from here over yonder. Can I have an amen? I want to be a ferry boat, man. I want to, I want to pick some people up over here, and I want to carry them and set them down over in glory. Man, let's be ferry boats. Our purpose, our job as, a, as individuals, our greatest desire as a church, we ought to just be a ferry boat around here. And we ought to just pick everybody that we can up over here and carry them over yonder and turn them loose and set them out. A ferry boat. You go where I'm going with this now. All right, I got 23 things now I'd like to say about all this in our text tonight. If you're, no, I'm kidding. I, I want to be some kind of ships. There's other ships. I don't care one thing about riding on. Can I have an amen? Said all that to say this. Let's, uh, let's get on the ship. Watch this now. Sonship. Fellowship. Discipleship. Stewardship. Let's get on the ship and let's sail. Jesus is soon coming. Let's pray. Father, I'm scattered, I know.